Well, we're now moving into the first session called Rethinking Cities in the Global Economy, which will be co-chaired uh, by me and by Shevket Pamuk, who will introduce himself in, well, now, since I've already introduced myself. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. I am Shevket Pamuk. I'm the professor on contemporary Turkish studies at the London School of Economics. Go ahead. Thank you. Well, we're going to start um, with three presentations, um, and then we have a number of others who are going to uh, intervene uh, more briefly. And the first presentation is going to be from Kemal Devish, uh, who is Vice President and Director of Global Economy and Development Program at Brookings. Uh, of course, also related to Sabanchi University, was UNDP. Uh, if I listed all the jobs in the world he had had, uh, that would occupy the rest of the morning. So, um, Kamal, over to you. Professor David, there's Professor Shevket Pamuk, dear friends, colleagues, it's a great pleasure to be in Istanbul. I did represent the city, although you know it's a, these are large, uh, large areas of political representation for about three years in the Turkish parliament. And uh, when Ricky Burdett asked me to make a presentation, I told him, you know, one thing, I'm a macroeconomist, so what I'm going to do is try to set the whole urban development, urban policy issues against the overall world economic context. I will try to give you a feel of where we're at in the world economy in a very long historical perspective because, of course, urbanization is a very long-term and historical process. In a way, I was thinking, reading some of the readings that came out of the World Bank Growth Commission on urbanization, and like many other aspects of economics, the articles, the research is set in a national context. And in a national context, clearly, urbanization and growth is very closely connected. It's not necessarily causality, as we are reminded. It's also not always there. We've had some very rapid urbanization, for example, in Africa, in some African countries, which has not led to extremely rapid growth. But overall, urbanization and growth have been closely correlated. And the big bursts of growth have happened uh, when the share of urban population has been around 45, 50%, going up to 60, 70. It's in that, in, in that bracket that we see historically at the national level uh, a major acceleration of growth, growth accelerations. So that led me for a moment to think, well, what if we think of the whole world as one country? And if we look at it that way, then in fact we are now, we, we, at the turn of the century, the year 2000, we've reached a point, if we think of the whole world as one country, where urbanization has reached about half of the world population. And in some sense, again, this is just a, a thought, it's not a hypothesis or a research topic, if you like. But in a way, one can't help thinking, are we at the point of global growth acceleration, the way one would think would happen within national borders? Now, to say that, at a time when we're still living, although, you know, the recovery is there, the greatest slowdown in world growth, average, the greatest economic and financial crisis for decades is, of course, a little bit risky to say that we're in a growth acceleration phase. But here we are talking of long-term trends, and I will come back to, to this issue uh, after showing you some slides on the world economy. Now, these slides as I said, have to do with the overall global trends, and I will try to relate them then to the problematic of urbanization and the, the topic of the conference. This is a graph which I always, uh, a slide which I always use, which I think reminds us of something that many of us uh, forget, and that is that modern growth, or growth, real economic growth, is a very recent economic phenomenon. I'm looking at 
Shevket Bey, one of the great economic historians, it's not a surprise for him, but many people are quite surprised when they look at that, which shows us that, in fact, real GDP per capita was more or less stagnant for centuries. There was a little bit of growth, but not much. Modern growth, as we, as we have experienced it in our own lives, and as some generations before us have experienced, is a very recent phenomenon. Per capita income in the year zero was not terribly different worldwide from per capita income in the year 1,700 or even 1,800. And then we've had this acceleration. And of course, this acceleration is linked to urbanization. I haven't, I haven't got the graph, and I'm, you know, I, I have no time to do that kind of research as a macroeconomist. But I, I do believe that if one makes the link, one will see that the acceleration of, of growth, or in fact the existence of growth in the world economy, is closely related to the growth of cities and the productivity, the agglomeration economies, economies of scale, economies of scope that exist in an urban context. Now the second uh, point, I, I'm going to skip this. Sorry, what happened here? Sorry. Uh, the second uh, point I want to stress has to do with convergence and divergence. And trying to get ready a little bit for, for this conference, reading some of the urban development and urban growth and theories and, and articles on that. One of the big debates, of course, is to what extent does urbanization, is urbanization a convergence phenomenon or a divergence phenomenon? And it's both, of course, depending on the circumstances. Well, the same question can be asked about the world economy. To what extent has it been a convergence phenomenon? To what extent has it been a divergence phenomenon? Here we see the various uh, regions of the world in terms of per capita GDP, and we see how much everybody was more or less equal for 18 centuries that this Madison data covers. And then a burst of divergence with some countries growing much, some regions growing much faster, and again, linked, of course, to the fact that these regions were the ones that urbanized. Uh, when we look at the more recent period, the, the period where there has been growth, we cannot really see a very clear acceleration trend, although there is an acceleration trend after the, uh, with, with the Industrial Revolution, but it was interrupted, it was brutally interrupted by the First World War, the Great Depression, and the Second War, then took off again, after the, world, after the Second World War, we've had the most the golden age, so to speak, of economic growth worldwide. Then there was a slowdown after the first oil shock and the, and the slowing down of growth in the advanced economies. So what caused the slowdown in the early 70s was really the slowdown in growth in the US, in Europe, not quite in Japan. Japan continued to grow quite rapidly at that period. And the weight of the developing economies, of the emerging economies, was not yet large enough in the world economy to counteract, to compensate for that slowdown. But that has changed towards the 1990s and, and, the, and, and the new century with the emerging economies growing increasingly fast, but also having a much, through that growth, having a much larger weight in the overall economy. And we arrived to 2005, these data only covered to 2005. We've had the crisis of 2007. 2009, and of course the big question facing all of us economists in the world today is what will happen? Will there be growth, the type of growth we've experienced pre-crisis in the post-crisis world? We don't have time to get into that topic, but the last slide I will give my own kind of answer to that question, and I think it is related again to the topic of urbanization and economies of scale, which the economics of urbanization, which is a topic of this conference. Now, before going to that, however, let me show you a picture of divergence, which in a very different way with numbers and per capita income figures is not that different from the picture that Professor Burdett showed us, you know, of the swimming pools and tennis courts, I think it was in Sao Paulo, and the slums. In 1820, if you take the 10 richest regions, countries, today's countries, the, the work that Madison did uses the same geographical area, although not the, at that time, of course, the political boundaries were not the same. And compare it to the, ten, to the bottom, to the poorest 10, let's say, countries, 
The rich were three times on average as rich, uh, richer than the poor. Three times. And then you've seen, if you take the top and the bottom, you've seen a tremendous phenomenon of divergence over time. The ratio of the 10 richest countries per capita income to the uh, per capita income in the 10 poorest countries has reached almost 50 from 3. Uh, which, is, which is a tremendous phenomenon of divergence, of course. But having said that, we're here comparing only the 10 richest to the 10 poorest, or on the bottom part of this graph, the top 20 to the bottom 20. That does not mean that overall there has not been a catch-up phase in the world economy. We know, and I'll, I'll come to that graph a little bit later, that some middle-income countries, so, some low-income countries have become middle-income and have been able to catch up. So in the world economy, there has been both divergence and convergence. Divergence in terms of the top 10 or the top 20, the top, or the, the top and the bottom, but convergence in terms of some others. Again, that, to me, from a macroeconomic world economy point of view, very much uh, recalls what I'm reading in the urban development literature. That, in fact, growth is lumpy, that some areas, some subregions, some cities catch up, but in the very process of catching up, others are left behind, and there's even greater divergence between the poorest and the richest. So, uh, very interestingly, the, the urban literature and the macroeconomic literature have similar dimensions, although I, I'm not aware of a systematic effort in, in academia to link these two types of analysis. One graph which is also interesting, which reflects um, uh, a little bit what, what I just said, if we use Lorentz curves in terms of per capita GDP, for the period 1820 to the year 2000, and you know the, the, the more the Lorentz curve is away from the, uh, uh, from, from the straight line in the middle, which would be perfect equality, the more unequal is income distribution. So if we look at income distribution across countries, we see that, that the, Gini curve, the, the, the Lorentz curve becomes less and less equal with time, which reflects divergence overall. However, if we look at... Uh, population-weighted Gini coefficient, and look just at the effect of India and China, we see a quite interesting story. The red line is the Gini, in other words, the index of inequality without China and India, and we see that it is increasing over time. However, if we put in, if we take out the effect, uh, if, we, if we include the fact that India and China are in there and are growing much more, much more rapidly, then in fact the inequality is not increasing because of the very rapid catch-up of India and China weighted by their population. As I said, this Gini coefficient is weighted by population. We do it in an unweighted way. It won't happen because of China and India are just two of 192 countries. But that's, of course, not a very useful way of doing it. It's much more useful to weight the Gini coefficient by population. If we look at the world as if it was just one country. And there's an Indian friend of mine, an economist called Serge Pala, who wrote a book, Imagine There's Only One Country. And we actually plot inequality, or plot the Gini coefficient over time, over the whole world population considered as one single population. We see also that the Gini coefficient has increased quite a bit, but that thanks to the rapid growth, in some of the emerging and developing countries that the, the increase in inequality has actually stopped now. Now, what kind of structural transformation when we look at it from a country point of view are we looking towards? Um, I think this is, a, this is a very interesting slide and it's actually uh, something showing that what I think is historically unprecedented. But again, I say that under, you know, with due respect to the economic historians in this room, but I do believe that the extent of the structural transformation in the world economy is indeed unprecedented. When we look at, and these are just, the first two slides refer to the last 20 years. So this is not a very long-term analysis. 2030, well, you know, macroeconomists these days are very, very scared of making predictions for the next 18 to 24 months. But as long as it's 20 years, uh, one can be courageous and make, make some projections. The long term is a little more, um, well, first of all, it, you know, it's a long term, and second, the short term fluctuations tend to even out. 
But when we look at 1990, we see, and by the way, these are, these are GDP numbers at market prices, not at purchasing power parity prices. They're just, if we looked at it at purchasing power parity, uh, the, the share of the developing and emerging markets would be quite larger all through. But I, I've decided to present this in market prices. So in market prices in 1990, the advanced economies, the industrialized economies, uh, if you like, the, the, those that are cl classified by the World Bank IMF as advanced economies, were still close to 80% of world GDP. Uh, low income, 1%, the emerging markets, 18%, and emerging markets not including China and India, and China and India, 3%. If we look at 2010, and you know, looking at 2010, we don't have to make too risky projections. These figures are basically what we know will happen by 2010. We see already an incredible transformation with the advanced economies going from 78 to 67, and China and India moving from 3 to 12% of world GDP. Now, I don't think there has ever been, on this scale, there have been some small countries growing very rapidly. Of course, Japan grew very rapidly. But there has never been this kind of structural transformation in the, in, in, in the world economy in, in past history. Now, looking forward, of course, who knows? Um, it's, not, it's not easy to say, obviously, what will happen. I've made some forecasts. These are not kind of crazy or, or far out forecasts. I've done an informal, I've looked at various predictions from the IMF, OECD, World Bank, some regional development banks. So the growth rates that are in that little space uh, down, uh, down on, the, on the slide, I, I would say are close to consensus growth rates, maybe somewhat more optimistic than some. And if we assume that the advanced economies grow at 2%, and again, this is very much a consensus forecast for that period, 2% per year. Uh, with the US usually a little bit faster, Europe, Japan, a little bit slower. The emerging markets, 5%, maybe slightly optimistic. The low income, 6 I do believe some of the phenomenon that have, has made growth more rapid in, in the developing countries as a whole is finally reaching also the lower economy, the, the low income countries. And China and India, seven and a half. And again, this is close to a consensus forecast. Now, maybe we're all wrong. Maybe there will be a major slowdown. I personally believe there will be a slowdown in China compared to the 9, 10 that they're having, but probably go down to seven maybe. But on the other hand, I personally believe that in India there will be an acceleration from six and a half, seven to maybe eight. So if we take those two figures, we arrive at China and India alone, close to one quarter of world GDP. And if you take the other developing economies, uh, by, by 2030, the GDP of the developing economies at market prices, not at purchasing power parities, will already have reached more than half of world GDP. So this, this is kind of the, the overall, I think, world economic context that I see. I don't believe that the crisis of the last two years will lead to a very significant slowdown of long-term growth. I, have, I gave a lecture at the IMF uh, World Bank meetings in, in Istanbul, the Per Jakobsen lecture, which details the reasons for this. But part of the reason is precisely the economies of scale and the economies of agglomeration that are embedded in the urbanization process and the fact that particularly since the fall of the Berlin Wall, for the first time what we really have, for the first time in a long time, is an integrated global economy where the diffusion of technology is extremely rapid, technological growth itself is still significant, but particularly the diffusion, and of course urbanization helps the diffusion process a lot, is extremely rapid and is reaching now the whole world. Part of the information re revolution, part of globalization, is this reach of technology everywhere, including even into Africa, into the lowest, economy, uh, lowest income economies. There are demand-side demand problems. We have rediscovered the importance of Keynesian economics on the demand side, but provided that the demand side can be managed, and I think that the way that the crisis has been managed on the demand side shows that, that policymakers have learned, central banks have learned, fiscal authorities have learned. So while they had forgotten some of the Keynesian lessons, they have relearned it. So I do believe that the demand side management uh, will be successful over the next two or three years. And then what determines growth, of course, in the long run is the supply side, the diffusion of technology, 
and the availability of labor still coming into the modern sector, you can call it the rural urban sector or the traditional low productivity and modern sector, but the two largely in, inter, uh, overlap, as we know. So that process will still go on for at least two decades before we may reach the point where the modern sector, or if you like, the urban sector has become so large that the productivity growth will have to take place inside that sector and that the portion of it that is due to migrating into that sector won't be large enough. Uh, in, in, in that sense, we, 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 coming back to what I first said, if we look at the global economy as one country, we are actually at the point of accelerating growth given the traditional economic analysis, the, the traditional variables we look at. Final word, and very important, however, and Nick Stern isn't here, and he would have you know, been very mad at me if I hadn't added that. There is one major issue that may slow us down, and that is climate change. If the projections uh, of the IPCC are correct, and if the dangers embedded in climate change, and I believe they are, although there's a lot of uncertainty around it, the one factor, the one new factor that may limit growth from the supply side and that in that sense may make the productivity increases associated with urbanization and with modernization much more difficult to achieve is climate change and therefore the importance of addressing that phenomenon, I think it can be addressed, but it is a new constraint on world growth that we did not recognize five or ten years ago. Many thanks. Thanks very much, Kamal, for a terrific uh, context setting for us.